Okay guys, forgive me, I'm a little bit squeaky, but this is gonna be part two of the G3 Sportsman 1810 video. But before we go to On the Water, I'm gonna put something in here that I think a lot of us are gonna reference back to. And if you have a buddy who watches these videos that you say, hey, you're looking at 10 boat, have him come back and watch this video for sure because I'm learning so much so fast. We talked about this before. I don't have a point of reference to these boats. I owned one a long time ago but i've been in a glass boat, glass boat for over 10 years now so um i have been talking to and by the way so what i have discovered is most of my viewers are another version of me you're intellectually curious you don't care anything about watching a guy catch fish out of a ditch you're wanting to learn something you're wanting to share information you're wanting to look into interesting stuff so this is really fun for me in what you guys are teaching me and what you guys are saying this is of interest to me or be careful of this or look out for this so you guys said a bunch of stuff to me and i've had a couple of conversations with you uh and i will have more conversations with you but you said things to me that made me kind of go talk to some buddies of mine so i built this grid based upon those conversations and it's evolving this is real similar to what we had in the great bass boat search of 2021, which of course was the glass boat search, but we're going to modify it a little bit. So on the left, just like we had before, maker, model, length, beam. Now in this case, the boat weight, I'm not clear on yet because they give a package weight and they give a dry weight. But if I take a package weight, so if I track the weight of the motor, I get 1,645 pounds as opposed to the dry weight. So I'll clarify that and I'll, I'll get that noted here. But the conversation that got me wound up was hull gauge. And initially in my head, I thought, well, you want the thickest hull gauge you can get to have the most durable boat. And I thought, well, wait a minute, if you do that, you know, if you have 200 gauge aluminum versus 100 gauge aluminum, you just double the weight of the aluminum and come to find out most of what you make an aluminum boat out of is in fact aluminum. So there's got to be a sweet spot in there. So I reached out to my buddy Clay Clevenger, who fishes Palestine mostly, uh, who I owned a boat with years ago, a metal boat, and he ran a gambler before he got into an aluminum boat. And then my buddy Chet Slayton over at Toledo Bend, who, and by the way, both those guys take care of their equipment. But both of those guys fish two of the hardest lakes in the country on your equipment, right? So if you've never idled out a flat creek at Palestine, you'll use every curse word you know because you hit a stump every two feet and sometimes you hit three or four of them at a time. So I knew both of those guys had dented their metal boats. And actually I didn't know what kind of metal boats they both ran for sure other than Chet. So I reached out. So first I talked to Clay, but I'll talk about my conversation with Chet first. So Chet had dented his boats two times significantly that he remembered. One of those times he idled into a stump and he said, 100% my fault, storm was sticking out of the water, I wasn't paying attention, probably looking at his graph knowing Chet. Drilled it, put a dent in the front of his boat. He said, nothing awful, but it was a dent. If you were a guy who, you know, buffs your boat down after every time you fish out of it, it would bothered you. And I said, had you hit that stump in a glass boat, what would have happened? He goes, nothing. He said, you might have scratched a gel coat, but it had been something you could have buffed out. So that got me thinking, okay, maybe they're not as durable as everybody kind of thinks that you buy a metal boat to get a durable boat. But then he said, the other time I hit one, he described where it was and I know exactly where he was. He was making a corner going into a creek running about 40, 50 miles an hour. And he, late Toledo was down and he flat drilled one and knocked a big hunk, knocked a big bulge under the passenger seat of the boat. So much so that it impacted how the boat rode. The boat really wouldn't get up on plane. He, he had to get in it. He had to cut the slug floor out. By the way, it's really hard to get to the actual hull of a lot of these boats from the inside. But he had to cut the subfloor and pop that out with a, with a, a basically with a, a rubber mallet. He knocked that back out. But I said, Chet, if you'd have hit that in a glass boat, what would have happened? He said, it had been a Toledo Fouch class. He said, I probably would have tore the bottom out of that boat. So they're more flexible, they're, they're harder to actually destroy, but they maybe get beat up a little easier, at least, and we'll talk about this gauge thing more in a minute. Now, Clay and I had the conversation. He spends a ton of time on Palestine. 
And it truly is one of the stumpiest lakes in the world, especially if it's low a little bit. And his comment to me was, I dented it four or five times. Every time I went, in none of those instances did would it have damaged my glass boat, which he ran a gambler before. So he ran a, a well-built boat before. So that got me having a conversation with both them, but, but mainly Clay, he said, you got to really think, and this is what you guys, you need to think about and you need your buddies to think about that are looking at buying a 10 boat. You got to think about what you want out of your 10 boat. So the lighter aluminum, the, the, the lighter gauge, the lighter thickness aluminum boats, they have the advantage of weight. They don't weigh nearly as much. They probably weigh 30, 40% less, and we'll get to the bottom of that with this as we go through it. But then do the heavier gauge boats. So you get a much shallower draft. You get a lot more lift. I suspect you get a faster boat. You get <clears throat> a boat that you can fish super shallow water in. You get a boat that you can run if you're... If you're on the Arkansas River jumping over sandbars, or if you're gonna duck hunt out of a little bit and you're gonna jump over sandbars, you got a boat that you can do that easier in than in a heavier boat. The downside is it's gonna dent up a little bit more. The other downside is because that boat rides higher in the water because it's lighter, you're gonna get blown around more. So you gotta start thinking, and Clay made the comment to me that, that struck me. He said, you're looking at buying a, a metal boat, a tin boat as your secondary boat. I'm going to buy a 10 boat as my primary boat. I want something I can do both with. I want something I can go beat around shallow in, but I, I want it more durable than what I experienced in my prior boat. Now, by the way, so this particular boat, this G3 Sportsman, it is a hundred, uh, it is a hundred gauge. It is a hundred gauge aluminum. So the thickness is a hundred gauge. You can convert that to inches. I'm not going to do it here, but the, the Express, which is what both of these guys ran, they have three lines of bass boats. The top two lines are 125 gauge and the lower line is 100 gauge. So, and by the way, my understanding, I, I, and I've done no research yet, I'll get to it when I get to it, but the Gator Tracks may be one of the thickest, if not the thickest. And I think it is point, it's 187.5 gauge. So it's almost twice as thick as this boat. So again, what do you want? Do you want a boat that rides real light that you can fish super shallow in, or are you an offshore guy and you're buying a metal boat for other reasons? Now, in the past, and, and Clay and I talked about this and Chet and I talked about this, a lot of guys bought a metal boat because you could buy a similar length metal boat for half what you'd spend on a glass boat. It's not so much the case anymore, right? Metal boat prices have gone up substantially. So, I think now you got, before you make that decision, it is, do I buy a glass boat or a metal boat? I buy a metal one because it's cheaper. Now it's, do I buy a glass boat or a metal boat, but a metal boat fits my style of fishing better than what a glass boat does. So all conversations you got to have with yourself or with your friends or with your dealer or with the guys who make the boat you're looking at buying. So a couple of other things about it. Both Clay and, and Chet talked about the fact that those boats, a lot of the metal boats, have a tendency to ride high in the front. Now, one of the reasons you see on this slide, I put gas tank placement. Clay said in his boat, now, but his boat was several years old, the gas tank was in the tail end of the boat. And of course, that's where the gas tank and the batteries are the bulk of the weight in one of these boats, gonna get you riding more nose up. The downsize, and by the way, you start putting power poles, talons, raptors, anything else in the back of this boat, you're gonna get even more of that. Neither of these guys ran a metal boat with an Ultrax or a Ghost or a Garmin on the front. Those things are a lot heavier than the old Minn Kota, so that would lower it some. But you're going to get in some of these boats a more nose-up attitude, if you will. So I put over there on the right, did I notice that? I did not notice that in the G3, by the way. So Clay thought it was because there's a lot more weight placement in the back. Chet actually said he thinks as much as anything is because there's no weight in the front, right? There's just not much up there like there is in a typical glass boat. A couple of big graphs, great big, you know, basically a hundred pound trolling motor, etc. So just things to think about, things to think about what you're going to put on the back of the boat and how that boat's going to react to that. Now, why is this attitude, back of the boat attitude up? 
may be bad, you're going to get blown around more. Remember, most metal boats don't have much of a keel, so they're going to have a tendency to get blown around more. I did feel that, as I talked about in the G3. It's a modified flat bottom boat. Uh, some of those other boats, maybe a, some of those boats, that, you know, a crush liner or some of the other boats that have more of a V aren't going to have a tendency to do that as much. I don't know. We'll find out together. Or some of the heavier boats. Again, you think about it. If a boat is 50% heavier, it's going to sit lower in the water because they're all roughly the same size or we're going to look at roughly the same size boats. So there's less wind surface to get pushed around. Um, so what, and a guy made a comment in a video, actually on one of my videos, on the last video, and I don't know if he was echoing what I said in the glass boat videos, but what he said was, there is not a perfect boat. And I said the same thing in the glass boats, right? You can have a boat that rides great, you can have a boat that fishes great, you can have a boat that's super fast, but nobody makes all three of those in one boat. Everybody does their own thing really well, a couple of them do all things badly. But you gotta think about what you want out of a boat before you dig into this. Because in my head, I thought, all right, well, there's got to be a gauge aluminum that's going to be the right gauge where you get strength and, and weight. And I don't think that's the case now that I've started talking to guys who do this. Matter of fact, Clay and Chet both talked about they had actually taken uh, Clay with more success than Chet, something that I guess a lot of guys that run these boats do. They will take a volleyball or a basketball and stuff it partially inflated in between the jack plate and the boat and then pump it up and get more buoyancy in the back of the boat. Now, by the way, one advantage to that nose up attitude that Chet pointed out to me, and I had never thought about this. He, he made a statement that still kind of blows my mind. He's run, he's been in and run a lot of great big boats, but on Toledo Bend. He said, we always, Angie and I, his wife, always felt very safe in my express and he said, because the nose stays so high. He said, it is the only boat I've ever had for any length of time on Toledo Bend where I never buried the nose in a wave. And that's a big, big statement on Toledo Bend. It's super responsive, so you can goose it and get out of a hole on it. He talked about that. He said, if you like fish in shallow water, he goes, you can literally get on the pad at 40 or 50 feet. That's two or three boat lengths. He said it's super maneuverable at high and low speed. There's a lot of advantages to a metal boat over a glass boat, but there's some disadvantages too. And there's some advantages and disadvantages to heavier or lighter gauge aluminum. And we're gonna explore all this together. So I just wanna get all that on record. Let's go now to the on the water time in the G3. You'll see me running a little bit, see me fishing a little bit, can't catch a dang thing. But I only took three baits, I think three rods, so I probably should carry a little bit more with me. But anyway, here's the G3 on Well, I will say today I wouldn't want to be out in a 26 foot cabin cruiser. It's uh, it is ugly, ugly. But I will say I was real impressed with the boat coming across the lake. I know I got a lot of wind noise, but uh, it's rolling. I would not want to go end to end in any boat but this little boat, it's super responsive as far as how it turns at speed. Uh, it's got a great hole shot, easy to control the nose. Uh, I was impressed with that little bit. So I'm gonna show you a little bit of the ride from that back camera, assuming it doesn't turn off on us. So let's check it out.
All right, guys, so as you know, I do not shoot in a studio. So we got wind and we got challenges as we always do doing these videos. The plug on the back of this boat does not like my YOLO tech. So I, I'm not, I'm having a hard time or I'm, it's impossible to keep it powered up. So look at that. I am in the back of this little drain in Caney and there's bait fish all the way in the back back there jumping around. That's crazy. Anyway, so we've got our scale, we've got our, uh, we've got our level set up back there. I'm in the boat by myself. We're completely full of gas. The boat is, uh, you know, one zero. I mean, it's pretty level. And I'm, it, it is surprisingly, so that is me standing at the seat holes all the way on the starboard side of the boat. It's listing 2.8 degrees. And I'm assuming it's going to be about the same over here. A little bit less. Again, we've got our console on that side. Now, if you remember the battery setup, it's actually pretty evenly across the middle. So let's check it from the back deck. I can't read it. Actually, let's go all the way right there. So that's at the seat poles. It's a little more listing on this side. Uh, I'm moving it around a little bit right there. And then going to the port side. Again, a little bit listy, but if you had a guy on the front deck standing on that side, it would obviously be quite a bit more so. Uh, a couple things I'll note about the boat of just sort of stuff I've noticed. Actually, let me turn that camera off. You know, I, I paid zero attention in the Great Bass Boat Search of 21, which was the, the glass boat search, to pricing. I paid no attention at all. I'm paying a little bit more of attention, or I'm gonna pay attention here because I'm looking in a price range of boats. But I'm looking in a price range of boats rolling out the factory like this boat is because most of these boats are set up kind of as package boats. A little bit of electronics, no power poles, uh, regular trolling motors. But there's a couple of items that you gotta kind of think about you'd need to add to some of these boats and maybe not some of the other ones. The first one I've noted is needing power because of my GoPro. There is no e cigarette plug or USB anywhere in here. Easy, easy thing to fix, but there's none of those in here. Now, the boat, you'll, well, you just saw it, right? The wind's already spun us around. The boat does blow around more in the wind, and I think a lot of guys think it's because of the sides of the boat. I believe it's because of the hull of the boat. So most of these boats, now I think one of the crest liners we're gonna look at is not so, but most of these boats, and, and don't get mad at me for saying this, but they are to some degree or another a modified flat bottom boat, right? We had flat bottoms and we kind of made bass boats out of them. Well, because of that, there's not much of a keel going to the front of the boat. So because there's not much of a keel, they don't track as well as a glass boat with more keel in it. That's the downside. The upside is you can turn them around. I, and I'll, I talk about my favorite video, the video where Chet and I fished to lead a bend together. He turned this one of the, he turned a 20 or I believe it was a 20 foot express around in what couldn't have been more, it, there's no way it was more than a foot of water. And he was able to spin that boat around and get the tail end to swing around because there was no keel. So it makes them way more maneuverable in shallow water. Now, I don't think you have footage of it, but I was fishing up a drain over behind the church steps a minute ago with a rattle trap. And what I noticed happening was I was trying to fish into there slow and the back of the boat kept wanting to trail me. I wouldn't have had or, or, or slide out from behind me and get beside me. I wouldn't have had quite that much of a problem doing that in a glass boat, but it's just something to think about you're gonna see in most of these boats. If I see one that doesn't have that, I'll talk about it. But what I'll also tell you is this is probably the ugliest day that I'm gonna have one of these boats out. Uh, there's some side splash in all of these boats. It's because of the way that it's just a flat side, right? Or as opposed to like my Bass Cat or my Ranger, there's graduated down the side, the hole graduates to the bottom. So you don't get as much side splash. They figured out how to design them that way. You're not gonna see that, I don't think, in any of these metal boats. Uh, and I, as you guys know, I'm gonna tell you the truth when I look at them. I would, I mean, so far, there's nothing about this boat that I would say, I don't want that boat. It feels really solid. Now I say that, it doesn't feel like a $90,000 bass boat growing across the water. You got more sound, you got a little bit more, I'm not gonna say rattle, but a little looser feel than you do in a glass boat. But that's because it's an aluminum boat, right? It's a tin boat. Now what I have noticed it down here is, uh, most of the boat appears to be either riveted or in some cases screwed together. 
Now I think that's just on the on the cap. Everything on the cap appears to me to be aluminum. Now I'm going to talk to the G3 people. I'm actually going to talk to several boat manufacturers to better understand how these boats are built. But as I said earlier, I didn't see any wood in the boat at all. Um, it's a fun. It's a, again some of this is nostalgia to me, but it's a fun little boat to fish out of. Uh, especially if I was up the river or somewhere that's more conducive to fishing out of a very shallow draft boat. Uh, I'm not really worried about speed. I am going to try to make a little speed run down through here just out of curiosity, but I think it's a high 40s boat. But uh, I would at this point, just based upon, you know, a couple of hours in a G3, uh, I like it. Now, I will point out uh, that back in the original video, and I'll, I'll overlay it right here, those G3 insignias on the side of the boat, same thing as the Phoenix glass boat, same thing as a Vexus glass boat. This boat should be designed to be in the stumps and I think you're gonna rub those off. So I would probably ask them not even to put them on there and you can stick them back on it before you sell it. But uh, you know, that's just one of those things I noticed in the glass boats that uh, I see here too. By the way, there is also an old crap handle down here for your uh for whoever gets to sit in the middle seat so uh it's been fun i'd love to catch fish but i don't know i'm gonna be able to but i'm gonna fish a little bit more and i'll run camera as long as i have power i won't be able to power them back up again once i'm done but if uh if one is foolish enough to bite i'm gonna show them to y'all so uh let's fish a little bit more what do you say little deer standing right there One other thing I just noticed in this boat is there's not a secondary rod holder for your for your co-angler or as Billy calls them. Billy Squares, CoPro. There's no CoPro rod spot. I think you could probably figure something out. Maybe run a strap down the side of that's what I would do up here by the seat. So you could lay the handles up there and have the rods up against that wall. Wouldn't be that hard to do, but just something I noticed. Watch this little thing hop out of the hole. I mean, it just Woo! up on out of the hole. I suspect y'all could see that, but it raced right up to 48 and a half miles an hour. Uh, and that's not tinkering with the jack plate, you know, figuring out exactly what the right height, that, but pretty quick, 48 and a half miles an hour in a 10 boat. And boy, it's got a spectacular hole shot. Really good.
at night when we're running at slow speed. Okay guys, I know that was a super long video. I apologize for that, but that's the G3 1810 Sports. And remember, I'm not grading any of this boat so I've been in a bunch of them because I got too much to learn and I need to have basis for comparison. And this is gonna be hard because, because I'm not shopping for a boat right now. I don't know how I'm gonna do this. I really don't because you know one boat fish and that may be the way I do it if you want a boat that fishes really well super shallow water this is your boat if you want a big water boat as your primary boat this is your boat or it would be my boat excuse me not your boat you're gonna make your own decision as you guys always have and we've talked about that there's no boat just because I like a boat doesn't mean you like a boat but we're gonna learn a whole lot together uh, thanks for all your input. Please keep it coming and I'm still looking for boats So if you got a boat around Rayburn or up here around Dallas That's on our list or not on our list that we should be looking at. Please give me a shout out. So let's do I think this will be our second to last spark drawing of the year and we drew Donald Chancellor. Hey, that's a buddy of mine from Pearland, Texas So that is the first friend of mine. Well, that's not the first good friend of mine I've drawn all year. So his name is Skip, by the way, Skip Chancellor. Skip, thanks for, I know you signed up for, to be Spark Energy customer, so thank you for doing that. Keep your eyes peeled. Uh, it'll be an envelope coming to you that says rewards on. I'm excited. I hadn't drawn anybody that I'm real close friends with. So there you go. Skip Chancellor, you're this week's winner. Look for that rewards envelope. We got more stuff coming for you this week. I'll see you again before Christmas, but if, if you don't get a chance to catch my video, on Thursday, Merry Christmas to you. We'll be at Raymond a couple days next week, and we'll be back down for the BFL in January. We're going to fish a lot through January and February, so we'll get a lot of videos up for you guys. Thanks for tuning in, and uh, I appreciate it. If you'd share my videos with a buddy of yours, I'm over 15,000 subscribers, but I'd love to get a lot bigger and make enough money to do this more and more and more and more interesting topics and I really want to do some stuff underwater, but I want a microphone and they're a bunch of money. So uh, subscribers help. Shopping Tackle Warehouse using my code helps. Shopping Six Cents, Shopping Water and Optics. All of those things help greatly with my sponsors. Uh, Jones Trolling Motor, all that stuff. When you shop with those guys, whether you use my code, the link at Tackle Warehouse, or just tell them, hey, Ken Smith sent me your way, that tells them to continue supporting us so we can make good content for you guys. So. Thanks again for tuning in. We'll see you soon.